Thank you all for being with us. Uh, today, you are hopefully here for this event, Your Healthcare Decisions Exploring a Dementia Directive. Uh, in honor of National Healthcare Decisions Day, which was last week, our goal today is to encourage all of you who are watching live or watching the recording to start conversations and consider your wishes for care, uh, especially as they relate to dementia. Today's webinar will be led by Jessica Empeño, a medical social worker with nearly 25 years experience as a clinician, educator, and leader specializing in dementia, end-of-life care, and multifaceted support programs. She serves as National Director of Clinical Engagement and Education here at Compassion and Choices, and in this role, she leads advocacy, education, and clinical outreach efforts across the U.S. to improve care expand options and empower everyone to chart their end of life journey. My name is Megan Williams. I am clinical engagement program manager here at Compassion and Choices. I have the honor of working for Jessica in her endeavors. 
My background is in education, curriculum development, and as an end-of-life doula. I'm really passionate about this topic and thrilled that you're all here today. I will be behind the scenes for most of our uh, event today alongside my colleagues from our digital team. And again, we're so thrilled that you're here. Next slide, please. So the agenda for today, um, when you walk away, when you log offline today, we are hoping that we will have covered all of these things for you sufficiently. So we want you to be able to understand some of the unique needs of a person in the late stage of dementia. We want to define advanced care planning and really outline how it impacts those living with dementia. We are definitely going to get some time to really highlight and explore the Compassion and Choices Dementia Values and Priorities tool as a route to really uh, dig into some of these topics that we will touch. And of course, at the end, we're going to offer some additional resources for more information you can access, more, um, more information you can share, ways to get in touch with us or other groups that might be of support. Next slide, please. So just some quick information, some housekeeping to get us started. If you would like to enable closed captioning, you can do that by hovering your mouse on um, the bottom panel of your Zoom screen. You will see um, towards the right, there is an option that says show captions with a CC in a box. If you go ahead and click on that, you can go ahead and start captions. It looks like those are already going for some. If you are interested in making the screen bigger, um, depending on what um, platform you're on, you can look for a little view button in the top right. You can click the green uh, expand button on the very top left of your window if you're um, on, a, on a computer, on a desktop. Um, please also, you'll note down at the bottom, we have a Q&A feature also on that bottom panel. If you have questions that come up, please feel free to submit them there in the Q&A. Um, Jessica might actually get to them during her presentation, you never know, <laughs> but in case she doesn't, we will be responding to some as we are able uh, uh, in real time. And hopefully at the end of today's um, presentation, we will also have some time to, um, to actually present some of those questions to Jessica. If we run out of time, because there's just so many, um, we will be sharing those questions along with uh, this recording and a copy of these slides in a follow-up email in the coming weeks. I think we already got a question about that, so hopefully we've answered that right away. Um, I think that that is the, the main component of our uh, housekeeping. So next, um, I'm going to pass it over to Jessica to share more about Compassion and Choices and then really get into the presentation. Jessica? Thank you so much, Megan. Hi, everyone. So glad to have you with us today to talk about this really important topic. First, uh, you probably are familiar with Compassion and Choices, and hopefully you heard about this presentation through us. But in case you have not, Compassion and Choices is the uh, country's largest and most active nonprofit organization dedicated to really educating advocating and supporting people around the end of life. We are passionate about improving care, expanding options, protecting people's options, and of course, educating and empowering everyone to chart the end of life journey that is important to them, that honors their wishes and their priorities. And there's a lot of information out there related to dementia, and it can be really overwhelming. Everything from brain health and prevention to care strategies and support for families and care partners, and it's all really important. But few people beyond compassion and choices are talking about the reality that Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body, and other causes of dementia are not reversible, that there is no cure. And in that sense, dementia is a terminal disease, but very few think about it, let alone talk about it in that way. And so we're gonna be spending some time today really diving into that. Acknowledging this reality and providing people with the information they need to plan for the future is not only a top priority, but it's a big focus for compassion and choices. And through our work, we really seek to transform how people die with dementia and making sure that they're empowered to get the type of care that they want. 
Now, that in and of itself can be a lot. Not everybody has heard or talks about or thinks about dementia in that way. And so I want to invite you to just take a pause with me for a second, because this is a tough topic. Dementia is one of those things that affects most everybody. Most people either have been personally touched by the disease or know someone who has. Those of us who work in this area, we do it because we're passionate about it, because we see the toll that it takes on families, but also most of us, we have a personal connection to. And so often when you're dealing with dementia, it can feel like you're all alone because everybody's situation is unique. It can be so overwhelming to figure out where do I go for answers, for real information, for help? How do I plan for what's next? And it can be a lot to deal with, especially in the final stages of the disease. So we're gonna talk about a little bit about that today hopefully help you with some resources. Like Megan said, when you leave here, we hope you feel just a little bit more knowledgeable than when we started. Because there is so much information out there around dementia and so many different myths and misunderstandings, we wanna start with a few minutes to talk about dementia and the realities of dementia. Now, for most people, when they think about dementia, they think of memory loss, right? That kind of telltale forgetfulness, someone who's lost and confused, but really dementia is so much more than that. When we talk about dementia, dementia actually is a general term for a collection of symptoms. Dementia all by itself is not a disease. It's not a diagnosis. So when you hear somebody talking about dementia, what we're really talking about is this general term for a whole big collection of symptoms, not a specific disease or a diagnosis. And I would encourage you, if you or somebody connected to you has a diagnosis and it simply just says dementia, I would go back and ask more questions. Dementia is prevalent among adults over the age of 65, but it is not a normal part of aging. That's another common misconception. So we do see this most often in adults over the age of 65, but it is not normal aging. We do occasionally see diseases under the age of 65, and we refer to that as an early onset or a young onset. But like I said, this telltale kind of forgetfulness and memory loss, that's not all it is. And the symptoms can vary from person to person, depending on where and how their brain is affected. Now, there's also this misconception that everybody is at risk, right? Um, we said earlier, it's most prevalent among adults over the age of 65. And while older adults are all at risk, we do know that specific populations are at a much higher risk. African-American and Black individuals are twice as likely to be diagnosed with dementia when compared to a Caucasian individual. Hispanic Latinos are one and a half times more likely. And women are much more likely to be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or another type of dementia. In fact, two thirds of the people living with Alzheimer's disease in the United States are women. A lot of people will tell you this is a women's issue because in addition to being diagnosed at much higher rates, women are also more likely to be caregivers and care partners. So this is definitely an issue for women to pay a little more attention to. And also just to say, you know, dementia, this is a serious condition. This is a progressive degenerative disease of the brain that will eventually lead to a person's significant decline, frailty, and ultimately their death. This is not something to make light of, to make fun of. Now, of course, we should keep our sense of humor and sometimes, oh, you just have to laugh to keep yourself from crying, but this is not something to be made light of. Now, when we're talking about dementia, there are reversible and irreversible or treatable and non-treatable causes of those dementia symptoms. So reversible causes or treatable causes of those dementia symptoms are things like medications, 
dehydration, poor nutrition, a head injury. So if there's been a fall um, or a subdermal hem subdural hematoma where there's bleeding, um, even alcohol, substance use, uh, lack of sleep even can be an issue. But I want to call your attention especially to depression. Depression in older adults is a big concern. Often it goes untreated. Um, some There's a variety of different reasons and theories around why it goes untreated. But one of the reasons I really want to highlight this is a lot of times when we think of depression, we think of those signs of, you know, sadness, hopelessness, helplessness. But in an older adult, depression can present itself as forgetfulness, as memory loss, disorientation and confusion, which can also, right, mimic those symptoms of dementia. And we know that if somebody is living with both depression and dementia, they each play on each other and one makes the other worse and down the spiral goes. So we really want to make sure that we are also considering mental health um, and making sure that those are being treated if that is applicable. Irreversible causes. So these are things that are not reversible. These are not treatable or curable are the things you've probably heard about. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia symptoms, followed by vascular dementia, which has a lot to do with heart health. Um, back in the day, we used to call this hardening of the arteries. Um, this is the dementia caused by multiple strokes, by poor blood flow to the brain. Um, also, Lewy body dementia is growing in popularity most commonly um, in our, you know, kind of 65 or under similar frontotemporal. Frontotemporal dementia is a little more, uh, excuse me, a little less common, but when we do see it, it's usually in men under the age of 65. Now, it is possible to have what we call a mixed dementia or a multi-dementia where you've got um, maybe Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. Um, so those kinds of um, combinations are possible as well. Um, Parkinson's disease can be a cause of dementia. About 25% of people living with Parkinson's disease may um, at some point move into experiencing um, dementia symptoms. Now, this is by no means a thorough list. There are over 100 different types and causes of dementia-like conditions, and this is why getting a thorough diagnosis is so very important. Getting a diagnosis can be a bit of a process. It can be lengthy, but it is definitely much more than just a paper and pencil test. And if that's all um, maybe your person has experienced, I would encourage you to go back. When you're dealing with dementia, because there can be all these other causes, right, we need to rule those things out. So there needs to be some blood work. There needs to be some other testing to make sure that we're not dealing with something that could potentially be treatable. Now, when we talk about dementia, typically we talk about this in terms of a progression. If you're dealing with something where all of a sudden someone seems to be experiencing this symptoms, you know, they were fine a month ago and now kind of that all of a sudden there's this change, you're probably dealing with a reversible or a treatable type of dementia, right? You could be dealing with a urinary tract infection, medication side effects, or a combination of all of those things. But when we're dealing with a true dementia, a true progressive degenerative disease of the brain, there's going to be more of that slow progression, kind of where you look back over time and realize, wow, yeah, a year ago, things were pretty different, right? Sometimes it's in hindsight that we see things most clearly. In dementia, we usually talk about it in stages, and there are multiple different staging models. There's a seven stage, four stage, three stage. Um, a lot of us really focus on kind of that three stage model where we talk about dementia in terms of early, mild, moderate, middle, or severe, and late or end stage. But you may have also heard talk about mild cognitive impairment. And mild cognitive impairment, or MCI, is considered by many to be a, a pre-dementia um, because many do progress from MCI into dementia, but not all. The key is that when somebody is experiencing dementia symptoms, 
but it's not quite severe enough to interfere with daily life. They're still able to function um, as they did before, they're still safe, um, then it's probably not a dementia. So MCI is when the changes are there, but they're not significant enough to interfere with somebody's daily activities. In the early stage, mild stage, um, an individual may be able to function independently. They may still be working, making their own decisions, driving, being a part of social activities and things, and they may or may not be aware of changes. It really depends on the part of the brain that's impacted. So about half the time, an individual is not aware and may not have that insight. In fact, that part of the brain may already be damaged that they lose that ability to have insight and awareness of their own actions, but also insight and empathy into another person's reactions. So if you've ever cared for somebody and felt like, oh, just they don't, they don't see all that I do for them and there's that frustration there, that can be why. It's actually due to the changes that are happening in the brain. But in the early stages, friends and family probably are starting to notice that there are some changes there. Um, and the individual might be able to compensate, especially in social situations, because social chit chat, uh, those kinds of conversational skills that we have, how's the weather, how's it going, those kinds of things tend to stay intact pretty well into the disease. In the moderate or the middle stages of the disease, this is the longest stage. This is the long haul, especially for the caregivers, the families, the care partners. This stage can last for many years. And through this progression, we start to see significant brain changes, lots of symptoms, lots of changes to personality, to language, the ability to communicate, the ability to function safely and carry out those daily activities. A person in the middle stage will eventually need assistance. They will need care and guidance and eventually 24 hour supervision for their safety. And then in the severe or late stage of the disease, this is where the, the symptoms have become so significant and the changes are so significant that a person is not safe to be left alone. They do require that 24 hour care and supervision. They may no longer be communicating clearly. Um, they may not be able to leave bed. Um, certainly not able to walk around independently. Um, and this is also when we start to see they become vulnerable to infections, uh, things like pneumonia. Um, and actually pneumonia is the most common cause of death for a person with dementia, because anytime you have somebody who is not moving around a lot, um, maybe not swallowing as well, um, then the risk of defense, excuse me, the risk of infection and pneumonia really sets in. So because we want to talk a little bit more about this end stage and that experience of an individual who is at the final phase of life living with dementia, um, let's take a little bit more time and just talk a little bit about what that looks like as somebody's approaching the end of their life with dementia. A person in the later stages of dementia may have symptoms that suggest they're close to death, but it Sometimes they can live with these symptoms for many months, and so it can make it really hard to plan. It's really hard on the family and the people that are around them and caring for them. And so what we do see is they require 24-hour assistance and supervision, um, and that means that they're not able to participate in their daily activities. Um, as I mentioned before, they're unable to clearly communicate their wants and needs. So what that looks like is you might hear single words, they might say a phrase, but likely it probably doesn't make a lot of sense. You'll definitely see muscle loss and a loss of those physical abilities, the ability to grab onto things. They've lost those fine motor skills, um, but also they're unable to swallow. There's actually a lot of complex muscles in our throat here that make it possible for us to swallow safely. And so if somebody is losing that muscle, law, uh, muscle mass and the muscle uh, dexterity throughout their body, then swallowing can become really safe or uh, unsafe, excuse me. Uh, people are also usually unable to sit up on their own and become incontinent of bowel and bladder. 
They may, will probably be sleeping more than they're awake as they kind of withdraw from the outside world. They become less interested in what's happening around them. They may not recognize faces, even familiar faces. They may not be able to interpret. The brain starts to have trouble making sense of what the eyes are seeing. And then, as I mentioned, they be, do become vulnerable to infections. Um, and so we have that high risk of pneumonia, high risk of skin issues, but also a real high risk of sudden medical events. And so this is where we do see a much higher risk of going to the emergency room um, and being hospitalized at this phase of life. And so all of this is why planning ahead, planning for a life with dementia is so crucial. When we acknowledge that terminal phase or, and that terminal nature of dementia, it can help to normalize the conversations that need to happen and how important it is to plan for the future. So we're going to start by talking a little bit about advanced care planning and what that is. So advanced care planning um, is so important. And a lot of people will tell you that planning for the future is important, but did you know that only two out of three adults in the United States have not completed an advanced directive? So very few people actually have. And last year, Compassion and Choices did a nationwide poll to ask people a little bit more about this. And our results showed us that 93% of people felt that it was important to have an advanced directive and to have these conversations. However, only 37% of those people had actually completed an advanced directive of their own, and only 12% had shared it with their healthcare provider. Over 50% of those people had not selected a healthcare proxy, a surrogate, somebody to make decisions on their behalf. So while we know that this is important, we also know that this is something that people are not actually doing for themselves. And there's many reasons as to why. Um, sometimes people are waiting for their healthcare provider or their team to bring it up. Um, maybe the team is waiting for the individual to bring it up. It can be overwhelming. It can also be hard to talk about but I wanna talk a little bit more about what exactly advanced care planning is and what we're referring to when we talk about this. So advanced care planning is meant to be an ongoing process. This should not be a one and done type of situation. It's an ongoing process of discussing and preparing for future care. So this is something that if you were to become seriously ill, if you were unable to communicate your needs, this process is designed to ensure that your wishes will be respected um, in the event that you're not able to speak for yourself. And so this process includes having meaningful conversations with not only your loved ones and the people that are most important to you, but with your healthcare team. It's really important that they know what your wishes are as well because we want to make sure that those wishes are documented. So documented in your medical record with your healthcare team, but also documented on the appropriate legal documents. And we refer to these as advanced directives. And when we're talking about advanced directives, there are two really important components that are a part of all advanced directives. And that is first, what is it that you want? What are your care preferences, your priorities, maybe even the things you don't want? And then who do you want to make decisions for you if that time comes that you're not able to make decisions for yourself? But the important part is that we're sharing that information. We don't want to just complete these documents and then lock them up in a drawer. They need to be out where people can find them. And then they need to be updated and reviewed as life happens, as situations change. So if you are saying, yep, I've done all of that paperwork, I'm set, um, I would encourage you to look at when's the last time you went through that paperwork. Does it still reflect your wishes? Does it still reflect the people that you want to make decisions on your behalf? And if you need to update it, it's, that's probably an important thing to do. If nothing else, we encourage you to take a look at your documents and update them at least every five to 10 years. 
And then again, make sure you share those and have those conversations. So research has shown that planning for future care and having these conversations and completing advanced directives has many, many benefits. It, first, it helps align care to your wishes by making sure that um, you are able to get the kind of care that you do or don't want. Nothing is guaranteed, but if you have it in writing and you make your wishes known and you have those conversations, chances are much, much better that your wishes will be honored. Advanced directives also promote patient-directed and patient-centered care um, and can really, really uh, excuse me, reduce the burden of non-beneficial care. And that burden that can come with um, co-pays, paying for care that maybe you didn't actually want. There's that financial component through co-pays. Um, the burden of family members being put in that, in that position to make decisions on your behalf. If you've ever been in that situation, you know how challenging it can be to be asked to make decisions when you're not confident that that is, is this decision, that that is what that person might have wanted. So by having these conversations, completing these documents and going through that advanced care planning process, you essentially are giving someone that gift of knowing what your wishes are so that they can be honored. So when we're doing advanced directives, though, they really don't speak to the unique and specific needs, the way that dementia progresses over time. And so one of the things that Compassion and Choices recommends and also provides is a dementia directive. We are one of the few to offer a dementia directive, and ours is very unique among the different dementia directive tools that are out there. The Dementia Values and Priorities tool is a free tool that is an interactive guide to really help inspire people to think about and ultimately document their wishes regarding the care that they want or don't want if they are living with dementia. It addresses the unique needs that people face as dementia progresses. It is relevant for all types of dementia and as you go through the tool, it will provide you with an addendum that you can add to your existing advanced directive. It's additional information that you can share with your team, that you can include with your important papers. To go through the tool, um, it can take anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes to complete, um, depending on how much time you spend with it, how much conversation we hope that it inspires. Um, and then you'll have uh, that opportunity for additional conversation. When we updated this tool recently, so perhaps you've seen our old Dementia Values and Priorities tool. If you haven't looked at it in the last few months, you haven't seen the latest version of it. And we're going to share a little bit more about that in just a second. The updated tool does not require any information. It is completely confidential. It is no cost. It's completely free. And it is available in multiple different ways. So we have an online interactive version, which we're going to show you here in just a second. Um, we also have it available to complete as an electronic document, um, or we can provide it to you in paper. So there's a lot of different options there. Currently, all of those options are available in English, but I'm very happy to share that we have a Spanish tool that will be coming very, very soon. And we are working on additional languages and translations of the tool coming as well. So to find the tool, if you go to the Compassion and Choices website, under resources, you will find our Living and Dying with Dementia page. And as you scroll down, uh, you will see the tool there and you will be able to select it and view it that way. If you're familiar with QR codes, this QR code will also take you right there. And so you are welcome to scan that real quick with your cell phone if you'd like. And that will take you to the dementia tool as well. So 
let's look a little bit at the tool itself. In order to plan and make decisions about future care, it's important to have the information to make sure that you understand so that you can consider all the different options and the terms that are used in making decisions. And so when we were updating the tool, one of the features that we were so excited to incorporate are videos. Videos that explain commonly used terms, terms like quality of life or terminal illness that are commonly used but not always explained. And so the tool throughout includes these very short videos with medical professionals explaining these important concepts and terms. So for example, here is the video for life-sustaining treatment. Life-sustaining treatments. These are treatments that are provided with the intent of keeping an individual alive. So you can see it's very short and sweet and to the point. And anywhere you see a blue underlying link like this throughout the tool, that's where you'll find a video that you can click on and learn more. So those are embedded throughout. And then you'll see that as you go through the tool, it gives you bits of information to get you started. So it explains the important information that we hope you will take away from completing this tool and going through this process. And so in the beginning, there are a handful of slides and important information. So for example, how to choose your surrogate decision maker, things to think about, things to consider in choosing that person um, that might be your decision maker if you're unable. A lot of people assume it has to be a family member. There are some that would tell you it probably shouldn't be a family member. So this will help give you that important information. And then we start moving into um, in alignment with the POLST, um, Physician's Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment, which is a type of advanced directive. Um, in some states, it's called the MOLST or the MOST. Um, the tool will ask you questions, and then there are three options to choose from in your response. And those options are aligned with the POLST. And hopefully this is helpful in having those conversations with your healthcare provider. So there's a, uh, a screen here within the tool that will explain those three response options, again, with links to videos to help explain this information. And then from there, it takes you into answering a series of questions. There's about 10 questions that look a lot like this, and they're all designed to be hopefully as clear as possible, but to inspire you to think about things that are important to you. That's one of the things that makes the Compassion and Choices tool pretty unique among other dementia directives out there, is that it's not just about, you know, do you want feeding tubes? Do you want CPR? It's really about what's important to you. And so all of the questions are phrased in a if this is the situation, then this is what I want type of a format. So as you can see, as an example here, the first question is, if my physician or healthcare provider has determined that my dementia has progressed to advanced or late stage, then I want. And so you would choose one of those options. Here's an example of another question. If I am no longer aware of my surroundings, meaning where I am, the date, the year, who is with me, then I want. If my physician or healthcare provider determines I have six months or less to live, then, and so then we switch into a couple of um, additional questions here at the end that prompt people to think about important things. So this question is designed to encourage people to consider hospice. And if they're not familiar with what hospice is, to educate themselves and learn a little bit more about hospice so that they can make that decision. And then at the end, there is a screen where people can customize and really personalize this tool to the additional things that maybe we didn't ask, but that are important to you. So there's this open space where you can document um, additional things you might want. Um, for example, are you interested in research and clinical trials, um, maybe brain or body donation? 
or perhaps there's somebody that you do not want to have access to your health care or um, be a part of those decisions. So there's a space here where you can really customize it and make it your own. And then at the very end, you will have access to this document that's put together from all of your responses and all of your information. And it is then something that you can print, you can save um, and attach it to your advanced directive. And so we encourage you that if you, if you do this, um, which we hope you will, we would love to hear your experience. We'd love to hear your feedback. If you've done this already, would love to hear your feedback um, and your experience of sharing it with your healthcare provider, because that is the most important part. Have those conversations. Make sure people understand what you want, what your hopes are, and what matters most to you at the end of life. So in closing, I um, want to share some information and some resources for you that you might find valuable as you are thinking about your healthcare decisions and planning for the final phase of your life. At Compassion and Choices, we offer an end-of-life decisions toolkit, and this is a great guide for walking you through a lot of really important information. The printed version of the Dementia Values and Priorities tool is included in here, but there are so many other things and really important information about end-of-life planning, care, future decisions, things of that nature. Um, and so the QR code that you see on your screen will take you directly to the end of life decisions guide. Um, and if that's not working for you, then you can certainly access it through our website. Now, if you are somebody that maybe you're part of a group um, or you are a professional and you're interested in sharing these with your community, we are more than happy to assist you with a supply. Simply let us know and we'll be happy to help you with that. The death deck. Has anyone out there heard about the death deck? I share this because this is a really fun and kind of unassuming way to have really hard conversations and a great way to bring it up. Sometimes the hardest part is starting the conversation, uh, but the death deck can be a really fun tool to, um, there, there's a set of playing cards and uh, you, it's a card that each card has a different type of question on it. You can see an example there on your screen of different questions that are really just meant to get the conversation going. So this is another resource if you're thinking about, gosh, how do I bring up this conversation? How do I talk about this with my people? Um, this can be um, a little bit different approach other than um, you know, kind of sitting down and having a little bit more of a formal conversation. There are also a lot of other great resources and information out there. Um, and these are all organizations that um, Compassion and Choices is working with, happy to recommend, and has, has vetted the information that's available. If you're looking for more information about serious illness, about uh, planning for the end of life. Maybe you're interested in more depth information around hospice or palliative care. I would encourage you to connect with Caring Info or Prepare for Your Care. Those are great organizations that have state-specific advanced directives because remember, the state you live in may not be the only state that you need an advanced directive for. If you frequently visit or if you receive care um, or maybe you have a home in another state, you might need more than one advanced directive because advanced directives are state specific. Every state has their own law around advanced directives. So Prepare for Your Care and Caring Info are great resources that have state specific advanced directives in a variety of language, as well as really useful information about serious illness um, and the end of life. Uh, Goals of Care Coalition of New Jersey has wonderful resources, especially if you are a New Jersey resident. Um, and of course, National Institute on Aging, Alzheimer's Association, as well as Alzheimer's.gov are great, trusted, reliable resources for information on life with dementia, understanding the disease, um, the behaviors, the changes, caregiving tips. They have a lot of really great information on there as well. If you have something more specific 
that you're looking for. If you want to talk about your situation or you're looking for a particular resource, um, please let us know. We would be happy to assist you with that. Compassion and Choices offers an end-of-life consultation service where you can um, speak to a professional that would be able to help you answer those questions. We also have a lot of those resources and a lot of that information on our website. So I encourage you to visit CompassionChoices.org and we will be, um, you'll be able to find a lot more information there as well. So thank you so much for uh, staying with us for the duration of the presentation. And I see we have lots of great questions and we have time for them. Yes, thank you. So first of all, I just wanna remind, cause I just saw this question come in that we will be sending the slides as a PDF. So you'll be able to see all of those great recommendations Jessica shared. We'll also make sure you know that the link to the tool is there as well as a recording. So please don't worry that when you hang up, you're not going to hear from us or be able to access this again. So um, we're good to go there. So yes, the slides will be coming. One of the kind of early, uh, an early question, and, and we got multiple around this was kind of if somebody feels like they um, are looking for more resources, um, perhaps testing, perhaps trying to find out more information about their diagnosis. I'm sure some of those groups that you just shared, Jessica, would be ones that you would recommend, but what routes might you recommend for folks to take to kind of get more information and get support in that direction? I would definitely start with your healthcare provider and your healthcare team. Um, they are going to know you best and you'll be able to have those conversations um, around what's already been done, what do we still need, what have we looked at. If you don't feel like you are being heard or you are getting that information that you need, um, then we can certainly help you with some questions to ask. We do have on our website as well, Compassion and Choices offers um, a diagnosis decoder that can help you prepare for those doctor's appointments um, to be able to prepare for what are the kinds of questions I wanna ask. Um, but if you are feeling like all you have is a diagnosis of dementia and there's more to it, then I would simply let the doctor know that, but be specific. What are you seeing? What are your concerns? And what should we work on? Thank you. Um, I also want to answer <clears throat> quickly something that I will add to our resources is around pulses and mulsts and state-specific um, work. Um, uh, state specific forms and things like that. Jessica, can you share a bit about where folks can also access those? Because we wanna make sure folks have their state specific content, knowing that this directive is something that can be a supportive piece to that, but that they we wanna make sure they go to their state content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mentioned prepare for your care and caring info. Those are great resources for state-specific advanced directives. Um, I would also encourage you to check out pulsed.org, and that is a nationwide website that will tell you what states have a pulsed or which states call it maybe something a little bit different. Um, and if you're still not sure, um, not finding what you're looking for, then your uh, physician or your provider, your healthcare team in your area should be able to assist you with that too. Thank you. And can you tell us a little bit, those, um, the, the responses, which are aligned with a lot of most and post forms and designed that way, speak about um, things like aggressive, the aggressive care versus, um, as well as the allow a natural death. Can you, um, I don't know if you can reshare that slide where it showed the descriptions. I think that might be nice. Um, if I remember correctly, we have the videos linked. So folks, folks can kind of dive into that um, definition. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. So I believe this is the uh, slide you're talking about, Megan. So there's a lot of information here and it, it takes a second to kind of read through it. So I would encourage people to, um, you know, look at it more on the tool. But basically when you're filling out a post and when you're going through the Dementia Values and Priorities tool, you're thinking about the questions, these questions um, in terms of these three responses. And so this screen will give you the detail of what those three responses look for when you get to um, other, the next questions that come. 
So the options are live as long as possible. Essentially, we're talking about aggressive treatment. Keep me alive no matter what. I want everything possible to live as long as possible. So if it's surgery that you recommend, if it's CPR that you recommend um, or it seems needed, artificial nutrition and hydration, that's what I want. That's what the first option means. And yes, you can see all these little blue links are links to videos that explain what we mean by each of those because it's important if you are going to say, you know, I want nutritional support, I want artificial hydration, it's good to understand what that means so that you know what you're asking for. The second response is treat me, but not aggressively. So what that means is um, let's continue the maybe the medications I have for my chronic disease, um, my heart disease medications. I um, I'm on oxygen, I'm receiving dialysis. So I want to continue those things. But if something happens, um, I don't want surgery. I don't want things that are overly aggressive. So it's almost more that kind of maintain, keep me comfortable, but let's maintain things as they are. And then allow a natural death is also sometimes referred to as comfort care meaning I really just want to focus on quality over quantity. I want to focus on comfort care, avoiding things that might otherwise artificially prolong my life. And so those are generally speaking, the kind of three categories of decisions that we're making when we are faced with advanced care planning, with end of life decision making. And so that's why we designed the dementia directive to align with those as well. Thank you. And kind of one of the last kind of big groups of questions we got, you know, a, a lot of folks come to Compassion and Choices and look to us for support regarding medical aid and dying. And so there's a lot of questions about why that's not incorporated here. Um, and so I was hoping you could speak to that. Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you. So medical aid and dying for a person with dementia is a little bit tricky. So to be eligible for medical aid in dying, you do need to be diagnosed with a condition that is in the terminal phase of that condition. And what that means is that they have six months or less if the disease is to uh, continue on its normal progression. Um, and then you also have to have decision-making capacity at the time that you are electing medical aid and dying. So by the very nature of dementia, when dementia reaches that point that we are at six months or less, a person will have lost that decision-making capacity. Medical aid and dying do not laws do not allow an individual to plan ahead. So you can't put medical aid and dying in your advanced directive. So it's not something you can plan for ahead of time. Now, a person living with dementia could be eligible for medical aid in dying if they are also living with another condition or disease that is terminal um, at that time and still has decision-making capacity. So maybe you have somebody, let's say, with an end-stage cancer, but a brand new diagnosis of dementia. So they still have decision-making capacity, but they're still facing that condition that could be a possible situation where they might be eligible for medical aid and dying. So uh, it's one of those kind of, it depends types of situation. Um, and so if you have questions around that, we are happy to speak to more specifically to your situation. Yeah, and like Jessica mentioned, we have um, resources that we will share in the follow-up email regard with including frequently asked questions that we get regarding medical aid and dying. Um, and plans. So we will make sure to include those in the follow-up, especially since we got questions about it. So thank you. One um, <clears throat> other thing that I wanted to um, include, oh, excuse me. Sorry, there was more here. <laughs> While you're finding that, Megan, I want to lift up Laurel's comment. Um, she said, or excuse me, they said, research shows that people who choose comfort care live longer than people who choose aggressive treatment. And this is an amazing fact um, that we see all the time in hospice. I've been uh, in, involved in hospice for many, many years. And it is not uncommon that when people enroll in hospice, when they get palliative support, um, when we look at all the medications that they're on and we kind of clean them up a little bit, sometimes people do tend to live longer. They're kind of able to relax a little bit. 
um, fewer medications, they feel better. And so yes, sometimes people do live longer um, and graduate off of hospice, but they definitely um, will have a very different experience. And uh, so I, I just wanted to say thank you for that comment, Laurel, that jumped out at me. Yeah, thank you. And Colette, I see your comment as well. Yes, the the link to the video you absolutely can share to, to others. Thank you for asking. Mm. We're thrilled that you'd like to. Um, one of the things I wanted to, uh, here's what I had, what I had lost and I found it again, um, is uh, if you could reiterate, for, if you're wanting to withdraw nutrition, hydration, if you have very specific pieces, there's um, there's an open space for you to kind of give directive, but also if we dig into some of those specific three choices we can uh, choose from that might be involved there, correct? Where where would folks, or how would folks best? Um... So there actually is a question within the dementia yeah. directive that very specifically talk about feeding and nutrition and hydration and drinking. Um, so that it's not, it doesn't happen to be one of the screens that I showed, but there is a question that very specifically addresses that, um, that if you are at a point where um, you're not able to swallow or eat on your own, that you require assistance in order to eat those sorts of things, what would you want? So in addition to that question that is in there, there is also free space where you can um, elaborate a little bit more on that. The other thing too is, you know, thinking about it's a lot easier to um, not start than it is to stop care that's already been treated, right? Everybody has the right to refuse care that they don't want. So again, that just reiterates how important it is to have those conversations with your care team, but also the people around you, the people that could be potentially in that position to make decisions. People with dementia, over half of people with dementia visited an emergency department in the last month of their life based on a recent study. And so let's think about that. Why are people going to the emergency room? For some people, that may not be what they wanted. It might not be what they needed. We know that hospitals and emergency rooms are a, a terrifying place for a person with dementia who may not understand what's happening around them. So let's look at how do we prevent that from happening in the first place? How do we make sure that we're supporting care partners and families so that it's, you know, they're not calling 911 out of a panic situation, um, but that we're also having those proactive conversations about changes and decline that we're seeing so that we're not ending up in the ER and very possibly starting on an aggressive treatment that may never want, have been wanted in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. And one last thing that I think we can sneak in, because I think it's um, <clears throat> somebody asked, uh, can these documents also be used for other medical conditions? But we have other resources uh, for uh, documenting your wishes outside of uh, a dementia diagnosis. So we will make sure to include yes. those again in the follow-up resources and in our planning resources we share. So we've got more for you. You don't have to duplicate this one. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I think um, uh, we also, you know, if you have a specific, if this brought something up for you and you have questions, um, we, uh, I would highly recommend you um, checking out our end of life consultation website um, that we will share in the follow up. I will write it out uh, that way to kind of draw you to it, where um, you can look up some frequently asked questions and then you can find out how to get in contact with one of our end of life consultants to talk about your specific situation and they can support people from all over the country to help them identify what options might be available to them and help them get started if they're not sure where to start. Mm -hmm. I think that's all the questions that we had in the Q&A and we're right on time. So thank you all so much. I can't believe how many folks joined us this afternoon. And thank you, Jessica, for your incredible presentation. I always learn something new from you no matter how many times I hear it. So uh, based you. on the chat, I'm not the only one. So thank you. And thank you thank all for you so being much. with us. Thank you so much. Appreciate you being here. And know that we're here if you have other questions, um, ideas, suggestions, or information that we can help you with. Have a great evening.